uh, in collaboration with, as he has up here, Ramon Martinez and Scott McKeague, who you heard from yesterday. So, you know, our, this is something that's been around in the in the EG community for, for quite some time now, and, and I'm sure many of you are users and are excited to hear what is new in EEG Lab. So over to you, Arnaud, and thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So, so I'm going to show you some of the new tools in EEG Lab, as my title uh, indicates. And the first, the first, I'm going to give you a little bit of background so EG Lab really started in 1997. Uh, the first version that was released to the public uh, was really the 2003 version. Uh, we obtained NIH support, then we developed multi-subject uh, analysis in 2006. In 2009, we started to have new associated toolbox, some of which I'm going to talk here, and with recent developments. And uh, in 2011, as you'll see, EG Lab was the most widely used EEG research environment. Uh, in 2014, we got the plugin manager, and now we're working still on integration with uh, Limo, and I'm going to talk about that. So there's about uh, 600 functions in EG Lab, about 70,000 lines of code. Uh, we've had about 250,000 downloads over the past 10 years. There's uh, 6,500 6, users on the discussion list and 15,000 users on the diffusion list. We have had NIH funding since 2003. There's about 101 plugins right now, and all the plugins have been downloaded more than 100,000 times. And according to our statistics, uh, each lab is supporting $288 million of research at NIH uh, because we just looked at because we just looked at the uh, paper published uh, by authors. We cite EEG Lab as we use it for their research. This is a screen capture from a tool we use, which, was, which is called Mixed Panel. And every time you start EG Lab, it pings. It's anonymous, but it pings the uh, server. So we know that there's about 140,000 EG Lab sessions started per month. Of course, some users will start many sessions, so it's not unique users. This is the paper published by Anke and Kenko in 2011. And that shows that EG Lab here on top was the most popular software at that time. We also, on the bottom, we can see that the number of citations for our uh, reference paper is still increasing as 2019. There's about five citations per day right now of uh, the EG Lab paper. So now I'm going to talk about the uh, new tool in EG Lab, and in particular, uh, the general linear model. So this is using Limo. And, uh, which is an extension to EEG Lab, and this is a collaboration with Cyril Pernay at the University of Edinburgh. So the GLM is really is really a technique that uh, can replace actually all the statistical tests. So I'll, I'll show you why. So here is the blue region, and these are here images of different contrast, and what we're measuring is reaction time. So how can we model that? Uh, variation of contrast with reaction time. Well, it's relatively simple. You can pl plot contrast on one uh, axis. So here we'd be decreasing contrast, reaction time on the other axis, and measure, for instance, the, re the average reaction time of people for a given contrast. And then you can try to fit a line uh, through that. So to fit a line, you would have an intercept first parameter and a slope, the beta 1 parameter, plus an error. And you can apply, uh, run a software, or do some simple math on paper, and obtain these uh, coefficient, these regression coefficient. Within the general linear model framework, you do something very similar. You have the different reaction times, and they're modeled by the, uh, the intercept, plus the slope, and times the contrast level, and the different level of error. You fit beta 0 and uh, uh, beta 1, and then to assess if your model, if it's significant, uh, for instance, for beta 1, you can compare the fit of the model uh, with the regression coefficient beta 1 with the slope of a model which doesn't have the slope. You can also uh, look at beta 1 and see, using bootstrap analysis, if 0 is included in the confidence interval. So that's simple regression. And here we can see that simple regression is a type of general linear model. General linear model. What about ANOVA? 
So here's another experiment. Again, we're measuring reaction time. That's also an experiment we did where uh, you have to categorize different images of fish, bird, reptiles against, and this one you, you shouldn't respond. So it's a go-no-go -no -go task. You just press the button when you have one type of image, any type, any of these images. But you might want to know if reaction time is different for fishes than bird. Can you detect fishes faster than bird? And to do that, you can use another linear model where here reaction time is again a constant parameter plus the beta parameters that represents the category. So it would be beta 1 for fishes, beta 2, and beta 3 for birds and reptile, and again the error term. So for instance, for one trial, trial 4, we could have beta parameters 0, the constant, and it's a bird, so it's the second beta 2 and an error term. If we have another bird, we would get another error term. If we have another type of image, then we would use beta 1 or beta 3. So this is another type of linear model. As for the previous one, if you want to know if your model is significant, if your ANOVA in this case is significant, you would compare the fit of uh, the simplified model with the more extended model. So in this case, running the GLM is equivalent to using an ANOVA. And from a, a, a mathematical perspective, it's strictly equivalent. Now, the advantage of using this approach is now we can use an ANCOVA, where we can model both the categories and, for instance, the level of contrast. It's very simple in the GLM. You just uh, put the, all the beta parameters together. So you're going to have some beta parameters for the type of image and one beta parameter here for the contrast. And again, if you want to know if a given parameter is significant, uh, you just compare uh, the model with, without these parameters and see if you have a better fit. So that, that looks so nice. What can you do with that? Well, so be, before I get into that, I want to just show you uh, how you build the design matrix. So for instance, if you have trial 1, 2, 3, which here we have four groups, uh, trial 1, 2, 3 uh, are category 1. So they, they, uh, it's 1 times beta 1 plus 0, beta 2, etc. Then uh, trial 4 to 6 would be the second uh, category, uh, etc. And 10 to 12 would be the fourth categories. C is the constant, and then you have the error term. The way to model this is using this matrix where you have some measures. So this is the outcome. This is, for instance, the reaction time. You have your model matrix here, which represents this coefficient before the beta parameters. You multiply by the beta parameters, and you add the error. So this is the matrix representation of uh, these equations. And a simple way to uh, visualize this is uh, what we call the design matrix. Most of you are probably have already seen that before, where, uh, for instance, the white cell here represents 1, and the black cells represent 0. And the constant is always 1, of course. So if we uh, go into the field of EEG, this is our design matrix. So we have different trials here. This is one electrode we picked, and uh, we have 10 trials. And each of the trials is one row. And some of the trials are for stimulus 1, and for some of the trials are for stimulus 2. And then we have a noise level of the stimulus here, which is model as a continuous variable. So these are two categorical variables, and this is a continuous variable. And of course, we have the constants. So it's a similar ANCOVA that we mentioned uh, previously. Then you do the fit at uh, the first sample and then you move your window so you do the fit at every single sample you fit a different GLM at every single latency and then you obtain the time course for the categorical variable and the constant together with uh, error if uh, you do bootstrap for example and for the continuous variable you, obtain, you can obtain the 3D curve when you sort the trials by for instance the noise level so you can see variation across trials for this specific continuous uh, variable. So this is the first level. So this is just for one subject. And you can actually do statistical significance. You can uh, do statistical testing here uh, at the subject level by uh, looking at bootstrap here and overlapping with uh, zero. 
Then uh, at the second level, so you have your subject, the first subject, and then you would do electrode one, electrode two, electrode three. So here we only have six electrodes, but you can do all the electrodes for subject one, all the electrodes for subject two, all the electrodes for subject three, etc. And then if you want to assess any group effect, then you would process this beta parameters how you would usually process, for instance, ERP. So you can do t-test across conditions, you can do a two-way ANOVA. So this is the second level. So at the first level, you pick your GLM. At the second level, you do additional statistics. We could also see this seen as uh, fitting a second GLM at the second level. And this is what has been done historically for fMRI in SPM for years now. And we're just starting to uh, do it here for EEG. With the advantage for EEG that we're using bootstrap instead of statistical uh, uh, parametric statistics for increased robustness. Uh, I just want you to show you here a simple application, so it doesn't stay, it is not too abstract. Here, this was a paper published by Guillaume Rousselet. Here, Cyril Perne is a co-author. Cyril Perne is the one who developed the LIMO extension. And here you can see the design matrix for this experiment. They're representing faces and varying the level of noise in the face. And then modeling this as one of the beta parameters and here they could see, so this represents, this is, uh, uh, this represents the N170 in their model here. It's not really an ERP in that case. But we can see the variation across age. So here age is on that axis and here's time is in on this other axis. So this is just to show you the power of uh, using this type of uh, method where you can isolate specific parameters and see variation across continuous and categorical variables and remove the contribution of some of the categorical variables so you can see more clearly the contribution of other uh, variables. So this is now in EEG Lab. You can use it, and we're still working on it to make it uh, more user-friendly and developing documentation. Now I want to talk about another uh, tool in EEG Lab that's called uh, IC Label. And uh, this is a tool that was developed by uh, Luca Pion Tony Shini at UCSD, and he recently published a paper about this tool in your image. And what he did is that he did some crowdsourcing of uh, component labeling. So this is one ICA component. So this is a website you can go to. And on this website, you can learn to recognize components, and you can also contribute to that effort. So if you click the button to do the tutorial, for instance, this is what you would see. And then you have buttons on the bottom here, and you can select which type of component you think it is. Do you think it's a brain component? Do you think it's a model, muscle? Do you think it's an eye, heart, etc.? You have the scalp topography. You have the comp continuous component time series. You have the power spectrum. You have the source localization for that component, and you have a visualization of the continuous data. Upon clicking a button, you uh, get some feedback. This is what the expert think. This is what other users think. So here, most of the user think this is brain, mostly because there's a large peak here at 10 hertz. And, and then you move on to the next components. There's been about 20,000 of these components labeled uh, by different uh, people. The fact we were offering iPad to the winner uh, might have helped. And then Luca, in his paper, also compared uh, this to also what then what, what he did is that he, he used these labels and trained machine learning method to uh, detect six classes of components. He has brain, eyes, muscle, heart, etc. And, and he developed a plugin under EG Lab to provide feedback to users. So the plugin is very easy to use. You, there's just one menu. You call it. There's no parameters, and it tells you here the percentage of being within a brain category. So this is the dominant category. So for instance, here the first component, 47% brain, and then the rest of the five other categories make up the 53%. Here the third component, 94.4%, uh, but it's uh, eye components. And uh, we also have another eye components here, 11, channel noise here, 25%. 25% is very low, so really the the neural network, the classifier, didn't know which one it was. The advantage of this plugin is that it's very easy to use. For instance, this is how you call it on the command line. You just call IC label. 
it saves in the EG that the probability of uh, belonging to each of the six categories for each component. We've also made it Octave compatible, so uh, it's easier to run on supercomputers. And it's also very easy to integrate into pipeline just because it's simple to use, so we integrate it into our uh, EGLAB uh, pipelines. Another tool uh, we recently added to EGLAB is MobiLab. So it's the uh, possibility to process multimodal data. And MobiLab has been uh, published for some years, but we have some recent development in which we streamline for user uh, the possibility to import multimodal data in EEG lab. The problem with multimodal data is that usually you have eye tracker at a given sampling frequency, you have EEG at a given sampling frequency. Here in this case we have motion capture at yet another sampling frequency and you recall all that data and then how can you process it? Well, uh, usually you can process each stream individually but when you want to do some joint processing, uh, it is better to resample them at the same sampling frequency. So this is, ex this is exactly what this simple interface is doing. We just finished that last month. You just select the file. So this is a file in XDF format. So this is a file recorded using lab streaming layer, which was also developed at UCSD. And uh, then you can select the streams. I want to include uh, motion capture, I want to include eye tracking, I want to include EEG, and these are my marker streams, so these are the events. And then the plugins will uh, resample the different streams, and there is a complex system to calculate the optimal uh, alignment between the streams. And then they're all in EEG lab at the same sampling frequency, and you can do some joint analysis of these different streams. About multimodal data, I also want to mention the upcoming uh, channel convention we have for channel types. There was no, there were some channel types in in EG Lab, but now we're increasing the number of uh, channel types and also we're making it con uh, consistent with a framework that's called BIDS, and I'm going to show you in the next slide. So this will allow some um, more increased supports of BIDS, and also uh, this will help with uh, integration with the BIDS tool. So that's another tool in, in EEG Lab which we're trying to integrate, and it's BIDS. So BIDS, what is BIDS? So BIDS is the Brain Imaging Data Structure, and this was or this is a framework that was originally developed for MRI and fMRI. And in the EEG community, uh, we've uh, now uh, developed a version that's compatible with uh, EEG. So it's an extension to the BIDS framework. And uh, this is uh, the advantage of the BITS framework is that it's very simple to use. So this is a, BITS is a way to organize your data when you have an experiment. And the way you organize your data is in directory structure. So there is no database and code everywhere. It's relatively simple in the sense that you just have to organize your data in different folders. But the name of each file is important. For instance, here, just to give you an idea, you have a file called, uh, named Changes, where you have changes compared to previous release of your data. You have a folder named Code, where you store your code, or how you process the data. You have a file that's a description where you describe your data, and it's not plain text, with fields to fill, etc. You have uh, another one for participants. Uh, you have two for participants, actually. You have a README file for user. This is free. Uh, you can put anything you want in there. You have the original data, because the data, that's the raw data that's included in bits needs to be in a specific format. There's only four supported format, EG Lab being one of them. You also have the stimuli you use during your experiment. And this can be linked within the bits for the bits event that we can indicate which of the stimuli you presented. So if you have images or sound, you would include them in this folder. And then for each subject, so it's just subject one, you have an EG folder. When you have fMRI, you would have an fMRI folder. And for EEG specifically, you have a file describing the channel locations. You have a file containing the raw data. You have a file containing information about the task and you have a file containing event information. 
So if you were to do that by hand, uh, it would be very, it would be almost impossible because these uh, files are actually very complex. They have different fields, etc. So if you want to be compliant with bids, and there is a function, there is a, a function that's going to check if you're compliant. Uh, it's actually hard to do by hand. So in EGLab, we've uh, written functions. So this is the GitHub repository, and this is a plugin to EGLab to export EGLab study as bits data sets or to import bits data set into EGLab study. And when you import bits data sets, it might be continuous data. So we've also worked on all the EGLab menu to make it easier, for instance, to filter all the data sets or to run ICA across all the data sets or to do lots of operation across all data sets in order to be able to process uh, this uh, bids experiment. In EGLab, we also have tax reports. So head tags are tags which are associated to events to allow comparison across experiments. So these are standard and EGLab. So we, we are the one who, at UCSD who instigated this framework and EGLab has support for head tags. So we can process the data containing head tags uh, since head tags are not included in the BIDS framework. And uh, we're also trying to get closer to the BITS architecture, so it's easier for people to process BITS data in terms of session, runs, etc. We're trying to make, at the, at the group level, we're trying to make it as close as possible to the BITS architecture. This is the first EGLab data set, which uh, we released on Open Neuro. And uh, we're hoping to put more in there, this is just a simple EG, uh, EG study with 24 subjects, meditation study in that case. So you can download it on Open Neuro. Another tool we've uh, developed in EEG Lab is called NSG, Neuroscience Gateway. So this is a collaboration with the uh, San Diego Supercomputer Center, High Performance Computing. This is Comet, so this is the name of the supercomputer at UCSD. And to uh, run scripts, uh, eGLab scripts on the supercomputer, uh, you have two interfaces. One is a web interface. Uh, you, you just use your browser. Uh, you have to register. Anybody in the world can uh, register. And then you select eGLab. You upload your MATLAB script. eGLab is already installed on the supercomputer. And then you upload your data, and then you can run your script. Uh, on the supercomputer. Uh, For instance, each of the nodes on the supercomputers has 24 cores, so you can usually uh, use a PAR4 in your script to parallelize across 24 processors to process your data faster. We have another interface, what's called the eGLab interface through NSGR. So R is for REST interface. So now it's sending command directly from eGLab to the supercomputer. So it's even simpler at the web interface here. You just select your script, and then you send it to the supercomputer, and then you get notified when the script is finished, and you can download the resulting uh, data. This is a proof of concept where we've processed, using this framework, data from the child mind uh, database. So here we had 1,097 subjects with 128 channels, eyes open, eyes closed, and uh, we can see how uh, the, here the scalp topography changes, eyes open, eyes closed across age groups. So again, this is just a proof of concept. We wanted to show that it's possible to process large number of data sets using eGLab on the supercomputer. This is another plot here where this is using Amica. So Amica is a type of ICA algorithm it's one we've uh, developed, and uh, here we, we uh, went up to using 1500 CPU on the, on the supercomputer. This is a collaboration here with Amit Majundar and Suba uh, Sivanyanam and Kenneth Yoshimoto at the San Diego Supercomputer, uh, so we are working actively with them to improve these tools. And you can already download the, the plugin on the eGLab website and try it for yourself. Other tools in eGLab I wanted to mention is our uh, increased support for source localization and connectivity. Uh, most people agree that processing data at the channel level 
is suboptimal and that you have to look at the source level. So when you use EEG Lab, we have three options. One of them upcoming, you can use NFT, Neuro for Electromagnetic Forward Head Modeling Toolbox, developed by Zenit Akalen Akar at UCSD. So that's a plug-in to EEG Lab, and that allows you to use custom MRI, subject MRI, to do source localization. And we're working further on the integration with EEG Lab. So you can use these tools as well, even if you don't have the MRI of the subject. The standard tool to do source localization in EEG Lab is uh, DeepFit, and this is leveraging field trip function. Historically, it was only doing dipole modeling. Now we can distribute it source modeling, as is shown here. This is the Loretta model, and this is uh, localizing uh, component activity on the cortical surface. And then we're also working with Stefan Hofer for an uh, upcoming EEG Lab connectivity plugin, and this leverage functions in Brainstorm to do source localization, so we will be able to also leverage these tools. About connectivity, uh, historically we have the source information flow toolbox that was developed by Tim Mullen, which is going to uh, speak just after, and uh, was formerly at UCSD, now in the Pion company. And this is also a collaboration with statistician Wes Thompson at UCSD, to use a Bayesian framework uh, to allow to do inference across uh, subjects. So this is already in, in EEG Lab. We also, since our model in DIPIT is already co-registered with the field trip system, we can easily use the field trip connectivity toolbox. So we can already use that from the command line. So we're preparing tutorial and official function from the menu to allow to do that. And we're also working with Stefan Hofer in Berlin on the upcoming EEG Lab connectivity plugin. We have all the pieces and we just have to wrap it up to make it easier for people to use. Last but not least, I want to say something about the new plugin manager in EEG Lab, which came out about two months ago. This is how it looks. So there is a menu in EEG Lab to manage your plugins. And uh, here, you can see in red the plugins that need to be updated. In bold, all the plugins which have been installed. And in not bold, all the plugins which haven't been installed. For each plugin, it indicates uh, the number of downloads. So these plugins are sorted by number of downloads. The more downloads you have, the more on the top of the list you get. And you, we also have a star system. So uh, here you can rate the given plugins and also give uh, feedback to a uh, developer of that plugin. There's about 101 plugins, so it's hard to find the plugin you want. So we've added these two menus here on top, and the first one can uh, allow you to show you all the installed plugins or the ones which haven't been installed. And the second menu allow you to sort to filter plugin only the import plugin, only the export data plugin only the plugins which uh, filter artifacts, only the plugins would uh, work with ICA, etc. So you can only see a subset of plugins and it's easier for you to uh, choose your plugin. So I want to thank you for your uh, attention and also uh, thank the whole team. This is the Schwartz Center for Computational Neuroscience at UCSD. Uh, here two major contributors to EG Labs, Scott McKeg and Ramon Martinez. And also, I want to thank Cyril Pernay uh, here at the University of Edinburgh. Thank, thank you. you.